Minecraft has seen a massive expansion in the amount of things that it has to keep track of under the hood. From additional AI types to a hugely expanded block selection, there's just more information your system has to store somewhere. And in almost 100% of scenarios, it's in your dynamic random access memory, or in your CPU's cache. But how has the most recent 1.20.1 update affected performance? And what does the performance look like on the hardware I've got here to test? Before digging into the couple of tests I ran, I think it's important to discuss the hardware we'll be testing on. If you're wanting a strong Minecraft build, it seems like the CPU is one of the most important parts that affects performance in this game. I mean, you probably shouldn't cheap out on your graphics card, but unless you want to run shaders, you could literally get by with something like a GTX 970, or probably the much weaker and more notorious 1050 Ti. However, to ensure that we actually see differences in the tests, I still ran a somewhat powerful 1080p GPU, the RK750. I then figured running it with my i5-13600K clocked to 5.4GHz on the P cores would be enough to drive the A750 and perform well in single and multi-threaded workloads. The test system also has 64 gigs of 3600 mega transfer per second DDR4 to ensure that Minecraft can load as much data as it wants into memory. Realistically, this is still overkill, but during testing, the game allocated over 16 gigs at higher render settings, so it's still nice to have. The rest of the test system specs are in the description, and if you're interested, I've also left other details pertinent to the tests we'll be performing. Without anything else to say, let's dive into Minecraft Java Edition version 1.20.1, .1, and see how and why the game performs the way that it does. To start, I began testing the render modes to see which one provided the best performance on average. I tested with a 32 chunk render distance and a 16 chunk simulation distance to really stress the system and hopefully expose some of the wonkier performance. From the average performance collected, Minecraft doesn't appear to run all that poorly. However, after actually playing the game, I came to the conclusion that the 1% lows are what you really want to see near the FPS target. Even though all the render modes honestly provide pretty similar performance, the objectively smoothest one has to be the threaded mode because of the 29 FPS 1% low. I'm not showing the 0.1% lows on this graph, but the game went from 3 FPS in both the fully and semi-blocking modes to 24 in the threaded mode. This is a huge and noticeable improvement, and really shows that even though the new performance options aren't eliminating the stutter and poor performance at this high render and simulation distance, they're helping out, but ultimately is caused by a bottleneck in OpenGL's Java implementation. When your system is actually rendering the blocks, your CPU is setting up the different data points that your GPU needs to render. This action can be pretty easily multi-threaded, as a lot of the data doesn't have a particular order in which it needs to be operated on. I'm not going to go in depth on calling algorithms and the efficiency of Minecraft's code, but a limitation with OpenGL is that everything needs to be copied back to the single host thread. You can theoretically make the most parallel loading algorithm in existence. But if you're limited by the ability for a single core to do load store operations, then your algorithm, though it can keep the system fed and evidently does help with the lower end of the performance spectrum, is just bottlenecked by this design limitation. Keep in mind that OpenGL has been a thing since before integrated multi-core technology really took off. Okay, so if you're limited by single-threaded performance in this game, what can you do to make these data transfers shorter? Well, the most obvious one is adjusting your render and simulation distances. Keeping with the threaded render mode and fancy graphics settings, I began at the old 32 chunk render and 16 chunk simulation distance, and lowered the render distance by 4 chunks and the simulation distance by 2 chunks every increment. As you can see from this graph, a data trend is pretty easily identifiable, and unsurprisingly the 1% lows also increased, most dramatically on the 16 chunk render and 8 chunk simulation distance. The averages also increased as render distance decreased, However, once we got to 24 chunks of render distance, it appears as if things kind of start to plateau. It might be worth mixing and matching the different distance settings if you want to tweak your performance and maintain the ability to see further. The maximums also acted kind of erratically between the render distances, with 24 chunks surprisingly providing the highest maximum FPS by far, even when compared to shorter settings. To see if it's in fact the simulation distance that's primarily affecting the stuttering, I performed a test keeping the render distance set to 32 chunks and gradually reduced the simulation distance. After running said test, it appears as if there's a slight correlation between the setting and the 1% lows, 
but ultimately appears that most of your performance gains are going to be from reducing the actual render distance of the camera. Additionally, I ran a test to compare the fast graphics settings with the fancy graphics settings, and at 1080p with 32 chunk render distance and using the threaded render mode, the performance uplift from going to the fast graphics was so minor that it's really not worth covering. This is almost 100% down to the fact that we're CPU bound, but even with the CPU limitations removed with lower render distances, the performance gains remained minor and pretty hard to recommend if you've got a somewhat modern or more capable graphics card. It would probably help if you're running on Intel integrated graphics, but with the dedicated GPU, chances are you don't really have to worry about it. Additionally, I ran a few tests on older title release versions to see if or how performance has degraded over time. I tested on 1.19, 1.18, and 1.17, and from what I experienced, things don't appear to have gotten any worse with newer versions. Going back to a much older edition though, specifically 1.12, and performance on average is actually superior to 1.20 at lower render distances. However, at higher render distances, the latest versions perform superior on average and in the best case scenarios. Despite that, it still seems to be pretty dependent on what's going on in your world. And if you're worried about performance, then I actually probably wouldn't go back to older Java versions, and would probably instead look into the Bedrock Edition. Performance on said game is superior with the 1% lows, and most processors made in the past 4 or 5 years are able to run it smoothly and without issue. It's kind of strange, as when I was testing, things didn't really feel different on 1.12, but as the data suggests, it's superior in some scenes and falls behind in others. Kind of expanding on what I was saying earlier about the single-threaded nature of OpenGL, you can tell that a lot of the performance issues are due to this because the Bedrock Edition just doesn't suffer from these same issues. In fact, my system has no problem attaining smoother performance at similar settings, with much more GPU intensive effects such as multi-sample anti-aliasing. Obviously, if you were to run the RT enabled shader packs on Bedrock, you'd see a massive performance degradation, but with the default graphics, things just run smoother on the DirectX implementation. It's also worth mentioning that the Bedrock version was developed by a much more experienced professional dev team. The language that it uses, C and C++, isn't really that important, but what is important is the efficiency of the implemented algorithms. For example, here are two raycasting functions written in C++ and Java. You can see that the C++ one is literally casting the ray into the environment, and calculating hits at varying distances. Meanwhile, the Java implementation is using more advanced mathematical concepts such as dot and cross products to achieve an identical result with much less looping under the hood. I mean, you get nearly identical final images from both functions, but the frame times, even though it's written in Java, will be far superior on the second algorithm because it's more intelligently allocating compute resources. I'm not trying to say that one language is faster than another. But I'm more trying to illustrate that the fastest algorithm for accomplishing a particular task isn't always the most obvious or easiest to implement. Other software practices such as memory allocation and access patterns can also change from algorithm to algorithm. For example, one implementation of an algorithm may be able to quickly compute the answer by manipulating arrays of structs in memory. Another may benefit from a struct of arrays in memory, and the different data locality that that brings. It depends a lot on the hardware that you're writing for, but at the same time you want to design your software that you only have to write it once while being able to run it on multiple types of devices and or architectures. That's what graphics APIs try to accomplish, and whether it be DirectX, Vulkan, or OpenGL, they're all designed to be portable between the hundreds of different GPUs available at any given time. Each of these APIs have different levels of supported multi-threading, and OpenGL just happens to be the worst at it. It doesn't make it a bad API, as it's much easier to get software up and running using it as opposed to something like DirectX 12 and especially Vulkan. But this ease of use on the part of the developer comes with certain drawbacks, such as a single thread bottleneck caused by a need to copy all the render data back to the host thread. Like I said earlier, even if you make the most parallel loading and culling algorithm you possibly can, you'll be bottlenecked on OpenGL by the rate at which your fastest core can copy bytes. Another thing I think a lot of people also expect to be brought up is the fact that Java is just different from faster, yet quote unquote more fragile languages such as C++. Where a C language gives you the ability to directly allocate free and manipulate memory, often at the cost of program stability, Java lets you allocate and manipulate it, but you can't directly delete it. 
You can do certain things such as use the new keyword, which just like in C++ allocates a new object of that type on the heap, but directly freeing memory just can't be done, and it's all handled under the hood by the Java Virtual Machine. Python, even though it's a scripting language, operates in a similar way, where the interpreter handles all the memory allocation and deletion. This simplifies things greatly on the programmer's end, but as a result, simple tasks such as moving object references around in memory can't be done like in C with a pointer, and you instead have to copy the entire data structure if you want to use it somewhere else. This uses more memory since you're storing temporary copies, but once the function ends, it should be deleted by the garbage collector. It's just different how the two languages operate, and even though I personally have my preferences as to which one I would rather implement data structures and algorithms in, that doesn't make other ones that I don't prefer bad per se. Java is significantly faster than Python, but generally speaking, if you're going to do 3D graphics, I would stick to traditional C and C++ as there's tons of resources out there that can help you get your software up and running. You'll also have a better idea as to how your program is directly managing memory, which in some situations, like graphics programming, is vital to performance. So thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. This video is kind of different from what I usually make, but I've been getting some comments on my older Minecraft videos saying I should retest the most recent version. Let me know what you guys think of the tests and also what your favorite version of Minecraft is. That's all I really have to say on the matter. So thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.